Our next speaker is uh, Joe Sinkowitz. And uh, if, if anybody has looked at OPC charts, they will recognize the name Sinkowitz. How can you not recognize the name Sinkowitz? You know, not Brown or Smith or Jones. Um, Joe is, when, is the uh, principal science officer now of the, of the Ocean Prediction Center. Kind of, sort of, yeah. And uh, has been at the center for a fair number of years. Uh, he's really been a friend of sailors. He participates regularly in safety at sea sessions, uh, skippers meetings before a variety of races, uh, some number out here, and some number on the East Coast, well known. So we're really pleased to have Joe with us. Thanks, Frank. And yeah, I was on, I was the one on the stage in 2016 in the Pickens uh, Theater. I'm sorry. Um, uh, before the, uh, before that uh, Bermuda race. And what I harped on was that this is not one you're going to assume that what you see now is what you're going to experience. That there's a level of predictability that was fairly low at that time. The only problem is we can't really, trying to predict predictability is a real challenge. So that's my world, and I'm going to let you step into it for a little bit. So I'm the Applications Branch Chief. I, I, we have a very small group that supports ocean forecasting for the Weather Service over the North Atlantic and North Pacific. And I happen to hold the, the Branch Chief position for that. Um, uh, we're in College Park, Maryland, uh, but you, I'm going to let you see some of the windows to the world that I live in uh, and some of the tools, because we live in a really marvelous age. It's phenomenal, the tools that we have. Uh, and I, I hope you gain an appreciation. One is that we work internationally together, uh, our European colleagues, somewhat with our Asian colleagues. Uh, we share data and with the whole idea of trying to keep people safe that are operating out over the oceans or sailing for recreation over the oceans or just trying to uh, transit. So I'm going to talk about, this is kind of a loose process in products, but you're going to see a bunch of stuff. All right, first things first, why do we do this? Why is the U.S. committed to doing uh, forecasting for large ocean areas in support of not just commerce, but really in the vein of safety, safety of life at sea, uh, trying to keep property safe, and also there's an aspect of it for economic enhancement, that uh, trying to optimize uh, uh, for uh, tr uh, transit across the ocean. This is from uh, 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 marine traffic. It has a density, uh, the density plots of where ships are. This is turned in the year 2016. You'll see one from 17 a little bit farther along. Um, and the world is divided up into what they call med areas. So med area 12 is here in the Pacific that goes all the way from the Bering Strait all the way down to the equator. Actually, it's a little bit south of the equator right here off, uh, off the uh, uh, Peruvian coast. Actually, and Peru does this forecast area here, med area 16. So the U.S. has med area 12 and then also has med area 4 in the, in the Atlantic all the way from uh, uh, Davis Strait and Denmark Strait uh, down to seven north, and I'll show you how that's divided. And you can see the other nations that have, there are 16 nations that basically contribute internationally uh, to the med area forecast for around the globe. The med areas and the navigation safety areas are the same areas with the same responsibility. So the U.S. has the responsibility for both. And the NAV area is basically managed by the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency in the U.S. side, in other organizations across the, uh, 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 in other nations, it's just done differently. But there is a clear responsibility as to who, who has what. Okay, so this is the way the U.S. divided things up. My own office, the Ocean Prediction Center, here basically has from 31 north northward, uh, west of 35 in the Atlantic, so the west and north Atlantic, and then from 30 north all the way up to the Bering Strait. And we traditionally have always done out to 160 east. We still do that. Um, and I'll, I'll show you the products that we do, do for that. So for the total med area forecast, or high seas forecast is what, what you uh, call it, the Honolulu Forecast Office contributes in this area. And then the uh, National Hurricane Center's Tropical Analysis and Forecast Branch does this area uh, from uh, Central America, uh, uh, even to South America, uh, westward up to 140 west. And they do also the, uh, from 135 west all the way, including the Gulf of Mexico, the uh, Caribbean, uh, uh, in the, on the Atlantic side. So that's how we divide things up. Huge areas of responsibility, many, many, many sizes, uh, the scale of the, uh, of the uh, uh, continental United States. It can be busy. So why do we do this? 
because that ship hit an iceberg and sank in 1912. And there was a realization that safety at sea was really lacking. Standards, uh, also sharing information, but also responsibilities as to who has the responsibility to forecast. What it does is it defines, and we've started to use this language more for a reason, is it basically defines who the authoritative source is for the information for warnings uh, and hazards uh, within uh, areas of responsibility, that there is somebody who actually has that responsibility, and in this case, it's the Weather Service NOAA uh, on, on the U.S. behalf in the Met Areas 4 and 12. Um, this language we've, we've adapted, it's, it's fairly commonly used in government re, uh, places, because there have been incidents over the last few years where the, the, it's becoming grayer uh, because of information, where people are interpreting, interpreting information, making decisions, without actually going to the baseline information, the authoritative source information. And I'm talking about the loss of El Faro. I'm talking about a cruise ship in 2016 off the southeast coast uh, that sailed into a developing hurricane force low, experienced hurricane force winds, actually had winds, five minute average peak winds, this is five minute average of 131 knots. Um, it's a 1,200 foot ship with 6,000 people on board. Okay, so, uh, and we act to actually got asked and had to write a report to Congress because they were asking, why is this happening? Uh, so that's, that's that. So the U.S. is a contracting government, and one of the roles is basically to encourage basically the collection by ships of uh, weather information at sea. And next, next one, contracting government, is to warn ships of gales, storms, and tropical cyclones. Okay, that is our responsibility. Okay, okay. And next is to issue, at least twice daily, uh, by a variety of different means, uh, uh, weather information suitable for shipping containing data, analyses, warnings, and forecasts of weather, waves, and ice. Such information shall be transmitted in text. Oh God, that has to change. Uh, and you'll, you'll get a little thing with that. You'll see with the text that we're writing. Okay, but as far as practical in graphical form, and, and this is a change, and, and uh, uh, of recent in SOLAS is and in digital form. So we're, we're the international requirement is gradually, slowly changing so that and, and the form of data will be more in a digital format so you can make better decisions in, in an informed way without having to wade through a very long text, which I am quite used to typing. And everyone else. Okay, and this is the guiding document from the World Meteorological Organization, Pub 558. Manual on Marine Meteorological Services. This is a 2012 edition, it was updated at 18 and had some changes. One of the changes was to codify warnings a little differently than the wording in SOLAS. And to break it down by Beaufort, uh, eight and nine being gale, nine and 10 being storm and violent storm under the storm category, and then 12 as hurricane force. And that's inclusive for tropical cyclones and, and extra tropical cyclones, non-tropical, as Ken had mentioned earlier, uh, because our observing capabilities are such now that we frequently see hurricane force winds in extra tropical cyclones. That's something I, I hope none of you ever experience, uh, but to shippers who are principally the ones that are at sea, um, it's a real danger for them. I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, they've set the stage to start to change the way that we do wave forecasting and, and potentially in future updates, whoops, that's all I want to do, uh, by using the language dangerous seas, okay? That we're learning more about waves, we have more capabilities, and we're, we're setting the stage basically because, okay, the winds do one thing, they generate waves. The seas, basically, that's what does the damage, principally, is what does the damage. So it's setting the stage basically to, to improve that. There's also wording uh, changes with the visibility terminology, and then the other one is to really start to solidify uh, digital services. Okay, so that, that uh, uh, anyway. Okay, you should be familiar with these uh, via a book. You should not necessarily be familiar with these via your own experience. But these are the warning categories, eight and nine. Uh, this is out of an observing manual that's available online. Uh, for uh, uh, sh uh, ships, for sh uh, uh, but basically, 
the, way, the, 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 the great thing is that the ocean surface basically reveals, by its changes of the wind blowing across it, basically gives you an idea as to what the strength of the wind. You can estimate it basically fairly quickly within a range. Uh, uh, 34 to 40 knots and is force 8, 41 to 47 knots is force 9, and 10. Uh, you can just see how things look more shredded. There's more spray, uh, force 10, and then hurricane force is kind of more than you want to imagine. And I have seen hurricane force, but primarily from a NOAA P3 flying in ocean storms. All right, now you're really going to step into my world. Okay, so. We're going to look at a loop. We're going to look at December of 2018 over the West and Central Pacific. And we, we've talked about cyclones. We've talked about fronts. I want you to think about waves. I, cyclones are really thermal waves in the atmosphere. They break. They actually roll on themselves. And they're relatively frequent. So, you're going to see cyclones, fronts, explosive cyclogenesis, multiple centers, cold air developments, secondary developments, instant occlusions, and back bed and fronts. I'm going to let this run a couple of times. This, and I should describe this, so you, the white of the clouds and the different shades of it, the, the coloration, the more moist and the deeper the moisture is the green, you get to see where the gradients are. So for instance, there's a, there's a developing cyclone right there. There's a, some sort of frontal boundary in here. Uh, where you see the purples and even the browns, that tends to be much colder air masses and drier. So let's go ahead and let it go. Get a flavor. Can you believe it's turbulent? <laughs> That's only five days. That's ten. You're captain of a ship trying to go across that. There's, there's some really big cyclones. The other thing to get is an idea, a scale of the circulations that you see, is that how much, how different they can be. There's one where the pattern's amplified. Yeah, another, another. Cold air developments back where you see this, the cumulus clouds, the little dots. The 24th now. There's actually a tropical cyclone at one point right there. Look at the scale difference. We write a text to describe that. <laughs> this, this, is, this is actually, we have the same capability with the geostationary satellites. This is actually the Japanese Himawari 8 satellite. We, we have pretty equitable uh, capabilities. My, my, uh, our watering responsibility actually lies all the way from the Japanese satellite all the way to the European satellite with the two uh, uh, updated uh, geostation, the U.S. geostation, and it goes our series uh, uh, in between. Okay, that's where the ships are. That's 2017 with the density of the tracks. They're living through all of that. So, you know, when you get something, you see the label that it came from somewhere, it might have gone through some of that at some point, or they're trying to avoid it, okay? All right, and you see some cool stuff in there. I could look at this stuff all day. This is your crabbers, pollock fishing right here. This is all fishing in here. These are the ones that are avoiding weather. So there's a parallel sailing across the ocean right there. Okay, those are your bulk carriers, or maybe the ones that are going down to uh, uh, go to the pa Panama Canal. See all these westbounds and eastbounds right in here? Okay, they're minimizing the amount of time that they're within the economic uh, uh, exclusion zone, so within the 200 mile limit. Why? Because they have to change the fuel to a lower sulfur fuel when they're within 200 miles. So the way they, may, they mitigate it is they don't come out of the Straits of Juan de Fuca and jump, some of them do, but don't necessarily jump on the uh, um, uh, Great Circle yet till they actually minimize their time inside so they can actually maximize their time using high sulfur. Some, that has just all changed in the last, it'll be interesting to see what this year was like, but that has all changed within the, at the set on the, uh, January 1st. Um, all right. Reveals a lot. You can see it certainly with his fishing down here. Anyway, that's enough of that. <laughs> all right, so we do an analysis every six hours. We're in a rhythm. There's uh, basically 18 or 19 of us uh, uh, working 24-7, uh, uh, 365, uh, and we label all the storm systems by their warning category. 
So it, uh, you could think of developing hurricane force, that's this guy right here, it's gonna go northward and move up here into Alaska rapidly, that's a lot of distance in 24 hours, and developing and intensify the hurricane force as it comes across. Storm conditions, storm conditions, uh, developing gale, meaning it's 30 knots, going to be gale within 24 hours, and so on. So in the month that I just showed you, this is the breakdown of, this is for every analysis, I just counted the number of lows, and then the categories of the lows, just so you get an appreciation. Okay, so 28% of the 936, 270 basically, or 29% were subgale. Almost 50% were 34 knots or greater with wind. 34 to 47 knots. About 17% were of storm force. And a little less than 4% were hurricane force. And that was nine separate events, nine occurrences with nine separate lows. So short-lived over time, but really, really intense. So this here, we've started to use the language, not just heavy weather, but extreme weather. And that, that's what we're looking at. And the, the idea was, this is our report back to Congress, was on the extreme, it really impacts all vessels. It, it, it basically puts any vessel in these conditions, and there, there are waves associated with that, um, it's kind of to be determined, we have like the dangerous seas sort of thing. Um, but basically to start to distinguish that nature produces conditions that, that basically risk anyone that's going to venture into them. Again, remember we were reporting after El Faro, and we were actually doing it after the cruise ship with 6,250 people on board. Uh, went through, and there have been others uh, uh, incidents uh, since, unfortunately. Okay, so a little bit of reality. One thing that we have started to look at, we have a, a web application that was developed by the Department of Transportation, and uh, we're looking at ships and vessels to where they are. If you have an AIS and it's on, uh, I hope you know that not only is it being picked up terrestrially, it's going to satellites and that's being uh, distributed. So we can actually see where people are with AIS. And yes, people do turn them off at times. So here's an example, and remember the wave that I showed you? Okay, so start up with a satellite image. There's a ship right here where that very mature, very large storm is, and right in there is where we typically see, that's what Ken said, the bent back front in the example that he showed. This is just a bigger cyclone. Okay, that's an ultra large container vessel had 80 knots of wind on the nose, 110 10 knots was just earlier to, this, to the time that this was taken. And you can see the route of the ship where they had come up through Unimac, had dropped down through the Aleutians because of weather to the west, actually went through some gyrations coming south, trying to go west, and then eventually just turned west and went right into that. 1,200 um, foot ship, 14,000 TEU uh, uh, container ship, carry 7,000 contain 40 foot containers, uh, went right into a storm, probably with the thought, my surmising, that they could minimize the exposure to the storm because they needed to get west, compromise, okay? But they, look where everybody else is. This is a huge area where there's very, very few ships. The other thing we've learned is tankers seem to go through into anything. We've seen three tankers in two years go right through hurricanes. Not well, but going right into right through hurricanes. This also was a time when there was a very, very large, there was a Kona low uh, that had been very, very intense. So traffic was diverted up and over uh, this area of adverse northeasterly and northerly flow. Okay. We learn a lot. All right, so the process. On that one, that no report must mean success. I do know that that ship the year before had lost a whole bunch of containers. Um, um, in, in the North Pacific. Um, but from what we understand, we never heard that there were any. But we have seen pictures of ships coming in, uh, 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 like for instance, the Port of LA, where basically they're missing containers off the, off the stern, is one example I'm thinking of. Okay, it, so the process, All right? Everything starts with observations. And observations like the typical, you know, ter terrestrial observations, ship observations, but then it stretches much, much more than that. Observations that are taken from satellites, which we rely very, very heavily on. 
not just geostationary satellites just I showed you, but actually polar orbiting or low Earth orbiting satellites that have instruments on them that are tailored specifically and designed in order to feed the numerical modeling systems that we, we, we have. And we work internationally, basically, to, to optimize that uh, capability. And satellites that are actually designed to sense the ocean, both the surface of the ocean, but then also uh, 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 the height of, uh, say, for instance, the height of the ocean in order to determine current and circulation. Okay. Um, so starts with observations and then numerical models. And I'll talk a little bit more of this in a little bit. But two types of modeling systems, and we've seen both today, where one model, one solution, one answer at a given time. The wind will be 15 knots at this location at this time. Okay. If you run numerical models and you have some idea where you have data, good data, and have definition as to what's going on, and you have an idea where you really don't either have the coverage or there's uncertainty, you can kind of play with that in defining uncertainty at zero hour and run many models. And that's what's known as it's probabilistic or ensembles, which is what this is right here. And we use both. And we are, and I'll show this as a point I have at the end, is we will be migrating to more use of ensemble information over time with the focus of the, the safety issue of conditions of the extremes. Okay. Um, so, and there are also, out of the models, there are actually things that are post-processed that um, using statistics and stati statistical analysis, and then the, all that information basically is filtered through a human at a forecast desk. This is Brad Reinert, who actually works at the Hurricane Center now, but uh, this was a while ago, and you get an idea as to the screens. There's actually, he's got three there, he's got three there, and there's a PC right here. So uh, it's busy, and somewhere there is a phone. Um, so um, the role of the forecaster, one is, is to add value, to filter information, to apply their ex his experience, her experience, familiarity, and interpretation, work on a timetable, because we, everything is by time. We have deadlines. Okay, you can't, you can't, you have to have a person as a forecaster who can make decisions. That you, you have to make the best decisions you can, you gotta live with them, and you gotta keep right on trucking, because if you, if you waffle or you wait, you're really gonna fall behind. So it takes a certain kind of person to do this. Um, so the output that we do are the warning and forecast, the graphics and text that you've seen, graphical information, gridded information, although we're only doing a portion of this, and you'll see that glaringly in a, in a graphic coming, and then also the required text bulletins, uh, which again take uh, a, a, a lot of time in order to, uh, for us to produce. We're trying to become more efficient because it's limiting what we actually can make available. Um, okay, so that is that. So we rely on technology. These are scatterometer-derived winds from the ASCAT scatterometer. So those are on, there are three instruments. They're space-based radars that actually point, they have two, two uh, a series of, actually it's like three, three looks both ways to the side, so there's a gap in between. So for instance, we'll take it to this one. Okay, the, the satellite at this point is flying north, and there's a, uh, a, a right and a left uh, swath of detection. It's a radar that basically looks at the roughness of the ocean surface on the capillary wave scale. So you know how you read the wind, basically with your eyes? That's what this is doing, yeah. We still don't quite know when it gets to the extremes what really is the dominant source is what's being reflected back. But that doesn't matter as long as there's a sensitivity. Okay, so the, the color scale, anything yellow or more, uh, yellow to the brown, amber to brown, to reddish tints are warning categories. So you get an idea in, on this one series of times. So it's set pass, there's a pass there, there's another one there and there, and these are multiple satellites. You get an idea as the Earth turns underneath the orbit of the satellite as to what the wind field looks like at a given time. Okay, there, like I said, there are three of these. We actually, so those are European, and then we have one that we're using from India called SCATSAT. Uh, India basically, in the next two years, plans on launching two more. So they will have three. They're a different design, and they actually have a wider swath. Um, so it, it, anyway, we get a flavor for where the wind is. Okay, so. The highs that you're seeing, these are the highs in here. 
sort of stretched along. There's a high center right there, there's another one right there, and these are the ridges. And you can see that all the way along. Okay? There's a large low here. There's another one somewhere up in here. There's one sort of developing there. There's another one there. Um, you can see there's a front. That's wind. That's 20 knots of wind. So that's a front that kind of trails down. Uh, there's the uh, high off the west coast. And we don't have a uh, swath. It already had uh, 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 timed out when I took this. But there was northerly. You can see the northerly flow with the ridge all the way up into Oregon. Okay. It's an incredible tool and really gives us an eye on what is, what is going on. Um, um, these are storm conditions. Okay, these are storm conditions here. There's actually storm conditions right here in Shelikoff Strait. So just south of Shelikoff, Shelikoff Strait and strong gale, this is Shelikoff Strait right in here and also just to the east of Kodiak Island. We get to really see the detail. Remember the text thing about trying to describe that? Want to trade jobs? <laughs> the point is that we're using technology. We're pushing it. Okay, we're actually, I was in a meeting this past week where I was advocating for this. We're looking to see what we're going to do next in the U.S., how we're going to improve our observing systems, and we're asking those questions. We're actually a little bit behind at doing that. But we, uh, I think the message was pretty clear when I heard scatterometers coming back at us. Um, whether or not that happens, that's a different thing, but we're pushing to use international sources. Uh, um, okay, so we make sense out of all this. And in, in, in this is an analysis. This is the way we look at things, basically. I don't have the OBS up there because it, it would be a little bit more crowded, but at least it gives you an idea. Okay, circulation centers as to where they are. Remember the pressure gradient? So the yellow are the isobars. These are the fronts, and you can see the features associated with the fronts, with the clouds. Um, there's a reality to what we're doing. It's not the fiction you know, from you know, 120 years ago when they didn't have da data. We're actually kind of like engineering, basically. I mean, it, there's an art form to it, kind of, sort of, but we're trying to cut down the art form so that actually we're producing something that's relatively consistent. Okay? And, and I'm so glad that we went through the description of pressure. Yes, sir? Okay, so we cheat. Okay? We cheat very easily. We have numerical models. So we start with a numerical model and then adjust it very subtly to the, to the, model, to the, uh, to the data. It, it may be that we don't, we, ha we may have a whole storm system without an observation in it. It doesn't mean there's nobody there, it just means that basically they're not taking observations. But yeah, we make, we make, we estimate a lot. Remember that decision thing I was saying about? Yeah, it's a cool job. Yeah, I mean, you got a run and gun. <laughs> You're trying to do something like this. We, on a shift, an individual does two of these per day, a series of products, and then also does the high, the high seas forecast typing. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's, it's and, and this is basically Ice Edge also. We don't do that. We actually import that from uh, uh, another portion of, uh, actually, it, it's actually now part of our, our organization. The blue line is the Ice Edge? Yeah, yeah, the, the dash blue line, yeah. Okay. All right, so web page, oceanweather.gov, a series of, of things. I'm not going to go through everything, 500 millibar, and then it, it basically, in, in the next sheet, you'll see what's, what's below that, the series of products that, that Frank and, uh, and Ken have already shown. And this is a high seas uh, text. Typically, here's the warnings by category, the strongest storm warning, and then low latitude, longitude, pressure, and how it's moving northeast at 40 knots. We had one of the lows in the Atlantic that blasted across the ocean in 24 hours uh, this past, uh, when we had the very, very, when, when the record of uh, uh, the uh, British Airways flight going across the ocean, okay, when that happened, well, there was a low embedded in that flow that intensified over the, uh, exploded, basically, intensification in the eastern Atlantic. That thing, it was over Newfoundland one morning, the next morning it was passing over Ireland, approaching Scotland. Uh, yeah, things were, were kind of ripping there for a little bit. Okay, and then all the gale warnings that, that, that go below that. Okay, so we prioritize the warnings. Freezing spray also is a warning, which we got a grim reminder of this year is important, just uh, southwest of, Kodi of Kodiak Island, uh, along the southwest Alaskan coast, or just off the coast, where uh, Scandies rose uh, uh, with five, on, five lost, two survived, uh, were able to get off, but in horrific conditions where they iced up. And, and it, it's, we, we uh, freezing spray is scary. Yeah, I drove tugs for five years, and I, I never liked when we would actually start icing up, because, you know, you're looking at, <laughs> it, it, uh, yeah, it just, you start to feel the boat kind of wallowing a little bit, and you're like, ah, oh, this isn't so good. Let's shorten the distance. Get, get shorten the fetch to cut down the spray. And it's not the wave spray, it's actually the spray of the vessel moving through the water. 
So you can mitigate it a little bit by turning down wind, which pushes you farther offshore, which may make it that you're going to have a hard time getting back in if the conditions continue for a long time. Tough decision. And then this is the bottom of the web page where basically the forecast 24, 48, 72, 96, uh, winds and waves here, and then this is automated, but it's a wave period, and it gives you an idea of the persistent swell uh, uh, over time, which is just plain, plain relentless. Um, and then not only do we do the high seas, but we actually do the offshore zones from 60 to 250 nautical miles from Cape Flattery all the way down to Guadalupe Island. Um, okay. We do do gridded information, but you will see there are two huge gaps. This one here and that one here, and that's us. And I, we don't like that, but remember the complexity we just showed you? We got the weather. And, and trying to take the next steps for us to produce gridded information, we actually are in the process where we have to migrate to a different computer system. And we're kind of like, we got one foot here on a gunnel, one foot on the dock, and the bow line's a little loose. That's kind of where we're, we're at. I mean, it's, it's an enormous amount of work and to maintain our, observation, our, our operations. So we're working on it. Our Hawaiian colleagues just did it successfully. Um, in fact, you can see in the Gulf of Mexico, our, our colleagues at the National Hurricane Center, uh, there's uh, gales there and actually manifesting themselves with the Tawanapec event right here. Um, so we're working on it, but it's really, really slow. I know I should look at David, because David always asks, where are we? You know, we, we're getting there. But, uh, Okay, so gridded by meaning that the output, we're actually interacting with numerical model data, where we have tools where we can get in and actually adjust the wind speeds. Uh, we can actually move weather systems, not efficiently, it's a kind of a drag to do. Um, wave height, same thing, is that we can actually, well, we want to boost the waves in an area, we can actually do that. And I think Cur Kirby, when he talks after me after lunch, that he's going to talk a little bit more about that as the tools that they use and all for doing. This is the way our weather service basically produces things. We're sort of the last uh, vestige of kind of the antiquated or the older way of doing things. I shouldn't say antiquated, but the older way of doing things. Um, we don't ever really anticipate not doing graphics, but we want to become more efficient and do more graphics with a gridded basis, which the forecasters have used. Stan. So this is the ND, the National Digital Forecast Database. Yeah, and um, hopefully you have these. You will have these slides. You will have these slides, and basically these are all links that you can go to, and there's a whole descriptor that will take you as to how to download this information. Okay. All right. We run a lot of models, and these are some of the examples that we have available in our office. Uh, so global scale atmospheric models, and I already mentioned about deterministic or probabilistic. These are the deterministic model runs, okay? Global forecast system, the Euro or ECMWF, European Center for Medium Range Forecasting, uh, the uh, Canadian Global, uh, the Met Office Global from the UK, uh, NAVGEM, uh, which is a Navy model, and then we also get the B, uh, BOM version of the UK Met Office model. Um, we don't, um, I won't say that, never mind, I'll leave that out, okay. That we, we have a, a version of the UK MET that is at a reduced resolution, and we have agreements with the European Center. We have agreements with the MET office, but we don't get the higher resolution, so we actually get to see the detail. Uh, it just is the way that it is. Okay, okay. So, and I'll talk a little bit about US versus European. I wanted to mention here one thing that we have absolutely excelled at, which kind of gets lost in the fray of, well, the European did this, the GFS did that, how come we're behind the Europeans? We flat out excel and you know, are the world leaders at doing short range forecasting, meaning out to say 84 hours or 60 hours on what we call the mesoscale as, um, um, in fact, everybody sort of is trying to, you know, with the lead, um, not only doing this, but actually doing ensembles of this because of the weather that we have in the United States. We focused on severe weather, tropical cyclones, land falling, okay? The mo we have separate models for that aside that depend on the GFS, but basically we have a whole suite of models that basically really contribute to our understanding of, the, uh, of smaller scale weather that is really, really critical, okay? Um, We've, we've had times when we were actually anticipating a severe weather event six days in advance and gearing up for that. 
you know, in the plains. Um, that's way different than when, when, say, when I started years ago. Okay. So high-res rapid refresh is run hourly. The North American mesoscale is run every six hours on a cycle. The RAP is run, I believe, hourly. Um, I, I, I should know that, but, but I really know what those do. Okay. We run separate wave models. The NOAA WaveWatch uh, 3 is run off of the global model. We also run at the local office level something called the Nearshore Wave Prediction System, which is actually based on a, a model called SWAN. And it really is to try and get to the detail of the wave characteristics in and around the coastal area. And the driving force for this wind wise is actually the winds that the forecast offices actually develop, the forecasters develop. Um, this, this is a real step. This is how we Humboldt Bay Bar, Eureka, basically. This is where that started, basically, is we had a weather problem that, that basically your severe weather in the west, typically, if it's not flooding, is actually in the coastal zone, in the water, in, in inlets. And it was designed, basically, it, the ap adaptation of this was designed to deal with that problem. The other thing that we've done very, very well is on the hurricane side. Now, what we've discovered We've done very well at track, even with the global models. As you look back in time, our track forecasts, our errors have gotten smaller and smaller and smaller as you go out in time. But the real challenge has been the intensity of tropical cyclones. That pretty much was flatlined for a very long time. Well, a lot of effort went into uh, uh, the H wharf model uh, and also working with our, our colleagues at uh, Princeton at uh, GFDL to develop coupled models that include the underlying ocean for heat and moisture exchange, and also the waves, because the waves really are important. As a governor, because of wave drag, they actually, there is energy that comes from the waves that goes back up into the atmosphere, okay, Be because of, of the shape of the waves. Um, so that's been a real step forward, and we're starting to chip away at intensity. Yeah, you can start to see that we've turned the tide on that, to quote a phrase. Okay. The sequence, and this is for the global, and I hate slides with all words on them, okay. Remember, everything starts with observations, okay? And we start with a short-term forecast from the previous global model run called the Global Data Assimilation System that actually is the, is the starting point of which the OBS are compared to. So we, we spend a lot of computer time defining now. Okay, and then once we do that, that's what this is in the data simulation mode, it, and this process includes quality control and filtering of data, uh, we, and then we basically use that as the starting point to start time and run forward. Um, and um, there, once the model is done, actually while it is being output, there's post-processing done to the, to the time steps of certain aspects of it, usually doing, you know, by knowing statistics of certain events, and then becomes available to the forecasters. Okay, then the forecasters go through their process, and in the meantime, the, the, the global data simulation system is run for the, for, for, to set up for the next cycle. Data's been collected the whole time. It just doesn't stop. We're just going all the time. Okay, this is what it takes to do the grid files, the grid files that you use. That's what it takes to get these. Okay, there's a lot that goes into it. Okay, so model comparisons. I grabbed this the other day. We, there's all kinds of different skill scores that, that, we can, that we use. Here we are, 500 millibar heights. Okay, so the, the, the graphic that, the, that Ken was showing, uh, basically over the northern hemisphere, the heights for that is, is basically compared to the observations. Okay, the observations meaning actually the analysis. Okay, so the, the, the data assimilation system analysis. This is for 120 hour forecasts. So what you're looking at is this number that basically says how good a fit the modeling system, GFS, European Center, Canadian, Fleet Numerical, or the UK Met, matched the analysis of, of a, of, at, uh, at, in the 120 hour forecast flow. So, it, it, the number basically varies between zero and one, okay? And here we are up around 0.9, which is considered to be you know, quite a bit of skill. And you can see in the GFS is that the black is to see we have some dips, we call them dropouts. And when we approach to 0.9, and then we have some real, really good 
uh, 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 times also where the verification is just phenomenal. You look at the red and you can see where they are at this, at, at, through this month, okay? And pretty, and the same thing with the green is you'll see that uh, um, the, our Canadian colleagues are either equal or a little bit ahead of us at this time. So when you hear global versus, when you hear the GFS versus the Euro, this type of thing is what they're referencing, okay? And I'll talk a little bit on the next slide. Okay, how are we doing time-wise? Five minutes? All right, yeah, wow, that's okay. Okay, so um, these are called die-off curves. So this is the same number that, that I just showed you, but averaged over a year. Okay, so all the way from 07 is the, is the orange to black is, the, is 2019. And what, so in this, this is forecast day going out in time. So what you're seeing is how the skill drops over forecast hour and the trend of that of the model cycles over time. Okay, so they're not laid on top of each other. So you're actually looking at sort of how the modeling systems have evolved over time. Um, so let's go up here. So 0.6 is sort of a magic number that's been thought of as being where skill, above that you have skill, below that you have less skill. Or, and that's sort of a critical point. Um, so you can see, and we go down, you see our European colleagues at 0.6 10, they're at, during this time period of 2019, they're down around almost 8.8, 8.9 days. So they have skill out forecasting wise, wise to almost nine days. Okay, so where are we? So we are at about 8.2 days. We're really similar out to about day five and day six, and that's where we drop off a little bit in there. Um, one thing you notice with us, and this is true with the Europeans too, there's one year in here that's blue that actually was better uh, than earlier. When we do model upgrades, we expect a slip in skill and then sort of gain it back. It's hard, it, this is a tough game. I mean, we're really, really tweaking things to try and improve, and sometimes an improvement to the system, like we just changed the physics core of the model, basically that, we knew we were gonna take a step backwards in skill. And that's actually reflected right here. So we're down here in 19 with a new model. This is the year before. But we're trying to move forward because you know what? We couldn't, you know, we couldn't repower. We couldn't really do anything more with the, with the model as it was. So we actually had to change the model to build for the future. And our European colleagues have done the same thing. We're never at the same time. Okay. Um, that's a typical grid file. I've got two minutes. I'm gonna jump to my last slide. Okay, good. Okay, it's not as bad as you think. Um, actually, I'm gonna end with this one. Okay, so I mentioned before about the text, and I, I'm not against us doing text, but when we talk to mariners, it's untenable for them to use. So we meet an international requirement, but we're not meeting a need for decision making. So there's an emphasis for digital services, okay, and by that meaning, in a hydrographic world. So there are standards for charting. We're actually working internationally to develop the standards for weather information, the same as for charting. Not the same standards, but within that vein. So that setting the stage, basically, for digital information to be available to help to make decisions. And this is an example of wind categories or warning areas, so purple, is hurricane force, this is red is storm, and the yellow is gale force. For a storm in November, early, in mid, it was right before Thanksgiving, that went into Northern California. Um, so this is vis visually what it would look like in the form of walling, war warning polygons. We would accompany this with a text that goes along with the warnings, but this actually would be able to be displayed in an electronic charting system including electronic charting display information systems aboard ship. So to help them to make better decisions, okay? And to help everyone that's out on the water to make better decisions. As an agency, this is where we're going for a variety of different things. We need to get beyond these long uh, sort of text descriptors. Okay, so, and in this case, we matched it up with where there are ships. There's a couple of ships in here, but in essence, our warning capability now isn't horrible. People are reacting. The problem is we can't present the information uniformly 
so that everybody has it without that very long text, which is actually required to be received aboard ships over a certain size um, uh, via satellite. So there's a printer, like some ships there's still a dot matrix printer in the back of the uh, bridge, and, and that thing, every time it goes off, you know, it kicks off and prints the thing out, and it goes into a file. And, and, and it really doesn't help. If you read the report of El Faro, that captain was relying on graphics. The only thing was, the graphics were being distributed by a non-authoritative source, and they looked pretty. The problem was they were 15 hours old. He was making decisions on old information in a rapidly changing condition. That's why there's an authoritative source. I'm going to stop there. Thank you very much.